Is the idea of the worship leader in the Bible? That's the question that we're going to ask today here at the worship pastor's desk. I'm Zach Hicks. Let's get into it. Is the idea of worship leader in the Bible? Well, the answer is kind of yes and no, and I want to start with the no first. The no is simply that we don't have that title directly anywhere in Scripture. And so if we're looking for the title or the office of the worship leader, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, we're not going to find exactly that. But even though the title is not there, the functionality, what we do, is totally there all over the place. And so I want to look through five, basically, zones of the Bible. We're going to look at the Exodus, we're going to look at the tribe of Levi, we're going to look at the Psalms, we're going to look at that bridge of synagogue worship, and we're going to look at New Testament. It's all going to happen pretty fast here. So first I want us to look at Exodus 15. Exodus 15 is pretty cool because it's the first recorded worship song in all of Scripture where the people of God gather and sing together, and uh, it's right after... Israel moves through the Red Sea. They've been chased by Pharaoh. The seas open up. They go through and they're on the other side. God delivers Israel. It's the big sign of redemption. And then right after that happens, interestingly, the people of God sing together. They sing a worship song. What we learn after we hear the worship song that they sing about salvation and redemption is that that song was actually led by a group of people. It says in Exodus 15, 19, for when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen, went into the sea. The Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. And then, here's what it says, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. So here we have our sort of first instance of congregational singing of the people of God. And it's led by a woman worship leader named Miriam on her instrument with a bunch of other female worship leaders leading uh, the people of God in singing this glorious song, Sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously, and the horse and rider He has thrown into the sea. Now, it's interesting that these song leaders, Miriam and maybe Moses too, right, along with their brother Aaron, are descendants of Levi, according to Exodus 2. And that leads us to our second part of Scripture where we're thinking about is this idea of worship leader in the Bible. Because the Lord sets aside uh, this one tribe of Levi to be priests unto the Lord. And their job is to take care of the tabernacle and the temple. But even in that subset of Israelites is another subset of Levites who are particularly dedicated to specifically doing the music, making the music, and leading the singing of the people of God. In 1 Chronicles 23, toward the end of David's life, David setting up the ministry of this unique subset of the priests of Levi, musicians who would lead from their instruments and offer praises to the Lord. It says in 1 Chronicles 23.5, that out of the 38,000 men in the tribe of Levi, 4,000 shall offer praises to the Lord with the instruments that I have made for praise. And then it says in in 1 Chronicles 23, 30 to 31, and they were to stand every morning thanking and praising the Lord and likewise at evening. And whenever the burnt offerings were offered to the Lord on Sabbaths, new moons, and feast days, according to the number required of them. So this is where we start to get the idea that among the people of God, God sets aside a unique group of people to lead in singing. And this singing has a central feature for the central act of worship, which is the altar and the sacrifices, and these worship leaders, these singers, are standing around and near this altar, wherever the focal point is of the worship service, and they're there to sing the songs and help people sing those songs too. And the other thing that they're doing is giving a musical context for one of the most important things that Israel is doing in its worship, which is offering these sacrifices, which has something to say to us who are Christian worship leaders. It means that of our many jobs, one of our jobs is simply to provide a musical context for the great once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It means that our central job is to think through how do we frame the gospel of who Jesus is and what he's done musically for the people of God. It's there in the Old Testament. You move on to the Psalms, and you read these titles in the inscriptions of the Psalms at the top, titles like choir master and director of music. It's The first time we see it is in Psalm 4, but it's all over the Psalms. It comes from this Hebrew word, natsak or menatseak, 
Most simply, it kind of means a leader, but in that context, it definitely means music leader. And these musical worship moments, it seems to mean like a worship leader or a music director. In 1 Chronicles 15, 21, it says that a group of individuals were appointed by David out of the Levites to lead, and there's that word, from their instrument, from the lyre. So because this inscription is over many of the Psalms, it sometimes gets translated as director of music or choir master or chief musician. But interestingly, this title prefixes 55 of about 150 of the Psalms. So this is a significant role in the life of the worshiping body is this chief musician who's there to help lead the singing of the people of God. But before we get to the New Testament, we need to recognize that by the time we hit the New Testament, the worship of God's people has changed a little bit. We're no longer in the temple. We're no longer surrounding and surrounded by temple worship. We're in the synagogue. And it's this period in between the Old and New Testaments called the intertestamental period that you have the exiled people of God developing places other than in Jerusalem and around the temple where they're gathering for worship and new laws and new rules and new ideas develop about how to do this. And it's important for us to understand synagogue worship because the first Christians in the first century who started engaging in Christian worship practices because of who Jesus is and, and what he's done really developed that out of synagogue worship. So if we understand what's going on in the synagogue, we can understand what was happening in the early days of Christian worship. And scholars generally agree that one of the practices that was part of synagogue worship was the singing of psalms. One scholar in particular, W.O.E. Osterley, in his book, The Jewish Background of the Christian Liturgy, reads this from the Jewish Encyclopedia. This is what happened in the synagogues with a song leader. It says, in the synagogues, the psalms were chanted antiphonally. That means back and forth with the leader and the congregation. The congregation repeating after every verse chanted by the presenter, the first verse of the psalm in question. Hallelujah was the word with which the congregation was invited to take part in this chanting. At the conclusion of the psalm, the makre, or presenter, or worship leader, added a doxology ending with, and say ye amen, whereupon the congregation replied, amen, amen. So what you have here is people singing the psalms. And they're singing the psalms in a kind of structure that uh, the leader sings the verses, and then everybody sings a chorus. And that chorus is just the first verse of the psalm repeated again and again. And the leader sort of triggers the congregation to sing that verse by singing hallelujah over the people, and then they respond. So you have a picture that there's an actual person who's standing in front of the people, leading them through the singing as well. So when we get to the New Testament, we don't see a title of worship leader, but we do get indications that the early Christians sang when they gathered together. It talks all over Paul's epistles and in Acts about the Christians singing hymns together. But before we get there, we might look at one place where Paul um, admonishes the people of God about the different roles of leadership in the church. He says in Ephesians 4, verse 11, He gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers, to equip the saints for work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. We don't have worship leader in these titles for the general spheres of ministry that God empowers his, his leaders to lead. We have these kinds of functions. We have the apostle, the prophet, the evangelism, and the shepherd, and the teacher. And I invite you actually to allow your understanding of worship leadership to be shaped by those spheres one thing that does for us instantaneously is kind of sober us up that what we're doing is a really high calling. What we're doing has a lot of value and it's important to think of ourselves in those pastoral sphere, spheres of apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. But secondly, it certainly helps us understand the purpose of our role, which is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. One of the works of ministry is worshiping the Lord. And so when we worship leaders faithfully fulfill our call, we're equipping the people of God with a way to praise their God. 
and uh, praise our God together. So we're equipping others for worship when we lead them in singing. That's what a worship leader's task is. But it's also to build up or edify the body, meaning that we're here to provide songs and the singing of the people of God among other things to help everybody be edified in that way. So I want to end by coming to the closest instance in the New Testament, in fact, the whole Bible, to the title of worship leader. It's found in Hebrews 8, verse 2. But I want to begin by reading verse 1. This is really important. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. We're sort of jumping right into the middle of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is all about Jesus being everything and all in all, including our great high priest, including our leader, including the author and perfecter of our faith. But here he's called a minister in the holy places. That phrase in Greek is probably the closest we come to the title worship leader. It's this phrase called ton hagion leitergos, or of the holy places, a liturgist, or a leader, a, a, a worship leader, or a, a liturgy leader. And funny enough, that title isn't used for just anybody. It's used for Jesus. Because one of the things that is the big emphases of the book of Hebrews is that none of us are qualified to enter into the throne room of God. But Jesus is. It's why I itch a little bit with the idea that the worship leader is someone who ushers people into the presence of God. I get it. It makes sense to me. But I read in passages like this that there's only one true worship leader who has clean hands and a pure heart and who can lead us into the throne room of God, and his name is Jesus. So if anything, our role as worship leaders is simply to point to the great worship leader who is Jesus Christ, who is qualified to bust open the veil and take us right into the throne room there. Uh, and so that means that I have three takeaways for us as we conclude this sort of survey of the idea of the worship leader in the Bible. First, song leaders really do have a holy and pastoral calling. If we're to understand a biblical understanding of worship leading, it's not something that's casual. It's not something that's flippant. It's not something that's uninformed by the Word of God and untouched by pastoral and theological reflection. It's holy, it's deep, it's real. Secondly, worship leaders as priestly music leaders has a long history in the Bible. And if you're a worship leader, then you share in the rich and ancient spiritual ancestry of that lineage. The Apostle Paul talks about the fact that Christians are spiritual ancestors who share in the seed of Abraham. And I think similarly, worship leaders who are a specific subset of Christians are called out as spiritual ancestors of the tribe of Levi. And that's an ancient and holy calling to stand in front of the people of God and to lead the singing of the people of God, to lead the praying of the people of God, to point people to the other aspects of worship that isn't just music like preaching and receiving communion and partaking in baptism and those kinds of things. Thirdly, I'd encourage you to develop a mental footnote in your head whenever you use the title worship leader for yourself and whenever you hear it used. I hope whenever you hear the, the phrase worship leader, you're immediately drawn to the title that is given for Jesus as a minister in the holy places in Hebrews 8.2. I hope that Maybe when you hear that phrase spoken about you or when you speak it, there's a little footnote in your head that says, but really it's Jesus that's the only capital W, capital L worship leader, and I'm just his servant. I'm just a steward to point people to that reality. So let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, I pray for these worship leaders, and I ask that you be pleased to take your word and implant it in their hearts in such a way that they might be able, by the power of your spirit alone, to live faithfully into their calling as worship leaders, as leaders in song, as uh, pastoral song leaders, and all those other good things. We ask all these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. See you next time.